Hey babes, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel for the first time. Uh, I feel like this video might get a few more new viewers, hopefully subscribers, because uh, of what I'm going to be talking about today, which is my visa, except not my visa because I didn't get a visa. They said ah, ah, to me. So I'm going to talk about the visa I applied for, the country I applied for, the process I went through because I know it's still like valuable for other people to know and where my hiccup happened uh, and what I'm going to do about it. I think I figured it out. I'm not 100% sure yet, but we'll see. So yeah, I got denied for, I don't even know if that's the right word. It was found unfavorable, which sounds, <laughs> sounds like kind of elegant, but also kind of like I was distasteful and that's why they won't give me a visa. But anyway, I applied for it, the D7 residence visa for Portugal. If you've, you know, followed me on Instagram for a while, if you've even been on this channel for a while, you know that I love Portugal so much. I have been learning Portuguese. I go to Portugal every year for my birthday and I really wanted to live there. So disclaimer, this isn't like I just decided because of the election this year and like obviously all of this stuff coming on that are going on that I wanted to move. I've always wanted to live not here. <laughs> I've, I don't know. I've always, I'm from a place in Louisiana and I always have said that I've spent like my entire life running away from it. And it's no irony to me that I got stuck here for going on 10 months because of the pandemic. Uh, but that's always, if you, if you followed me for a long time, that's why I'm a travel blogger. That's why I'm an influencer. I have wanted to be gone and wanted to set up a life somewhere else. I've always just felt like I fit in in Europe more and now that I've been to Australia and Australia more honestly and so this wasn't like a rush I, I know there's a mad dash right now for people trying to get visas and citizen or uh, residency in other countries citizenship is like a whole other thing we can talk about at some point but this is something that was like a long time plan for me and a long goal of mine a long-term goal of mine and obviously this year there was like an impetus to it because craziness so yeah, I got all of my stuff together. I was torn between a few countries, but because I've been to Portugal so many times, because I speak a decent amount of Portuguese, I know Lisbon really well. I know Madeira really well because I visited so much. I wanted to be there, especially particularly like I remember the last time I was there for my birthday in March and the before times, uh, we went to Belém on my actual, was it on my actual birthday? No, like two days after. And it was just so peaceful and sunshiny and beautiful and lovely. And there is a sense of home that I felt there that I've never felt here, even though I'm from the U.S. So, yeah, I was getting all my ducks in a row to apply to Portugal. And it turns out I was doing it at the exact same time as one of my really good friends who got his residency, <laughs> which is cool. Like, I'm very happy for him. And, like, with him, we got to go through this together and, like, moan and complain about it together and get all of our steps and ducks in a row together and so I'm really glad that he got his because now I can always go visit him. But yeah, uh, so the deep seven visa for Portugal is, um, so I was looking for a digital nomad kind of visa. Countries that have strictly digital nomad visas are uh, Austria, no, Austria, Germany has one, Estonia has one. Does Austria have one? Why is that the first thing that popped into my head? I've literally never thought until Austria, about Austria until this moment. Estonia, Germany... Spain has, I don't know if it's specifically digital nomad, but it's kind of akin to what I did for Portugal. Um, Czech Republic, you know what? I was thinking Austria was the Czech Republic for literally no reason, but Czech Republic has one. And there's another country that is putting one through soon, which I will be applying for, but I don't want to say which one yet because I don't want to jinx myself. But yeah, so I was playing for the D7 uh, visa for Portugal, which is like a passive income visa, which means that you're either earning money from the United States or you are retired or not just from the United States, but you're earning money from outside of Portugal or you are on like a pension or retirement income. So basically I don't have to rely on Portugal to support myself. And I'll go into that in a second with like applying for my visa and all the things I had to show for proof and something that messed me up in the end, I guess, which <laughs> we'll get to it. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's passive income. I can show that I can support myself because I freelance and I work with brands and I work, I do campaigns for companies that are not based in Portugal. So I'm not relying on them for my money. Basically, I'm not going to go there and be a drain on the Portuguese society and people and economy and everything else. I'm just going to, you know, go there and add wonderful things to it, hopefully. 
or that was my plan. So when you apply for the D7 visa as an American, this is obviously for Americans only, uh, you have to apply from within the United States. So it's not like I could go over there and be like, mm, I love this. I'm just going to stay here. And so you have to work with, uh, I worked with a service. Well, I don't know if I worked with them, but I got all of my information with them. They processed it for me. They sent it on to the embassy or the consulate. Disclaimer too, I don't know the difference between a consulate and an embassy. I'm just going to like walk in my truth now and say that. So I'm going to use the words interchangeably. <laughs> yeah, I know some of you know, so you know what I mean, but I'm just going to use them interchangeably because that's how I am as a person. I don't know the difference and it's too late to learn. It's not too late to learn. The service I went through is VFS Global. If you go to their website, you can like break down by country. There's a lot more than just Portugal and you can see, um, you know, all the requirements, which one you should apply for, what office you should send it to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the checklist that I got through VFS Portugal. I think I think we had to email in to get this checklist and let me give you a time frame. So this is like September, October of this year. And I think we did have to email them to get the checklist. I don't think it was on the website, although a lot of like other good information is there. So this is the checklist. Wow. To not show up. I'm going to read off of it. If I can be savvy enough with my editing skills, I will list it here so you can see all the steps I went through. So, oh, and I'll just read the top part. Visas are issued to persons who intend to resettle permanently in Portugal for A, retirement, B, independent living, that's me, uh, C, to establish independent business, D, to set up investments, E, to establish themselves as independent professionals in their field, F, to work remotely while receiving income from the U.S. So I'm not going to be a drain on Portugal. That's my solemn vow. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a note that says all residency visas are valid for a period of 120 calendar days. Once in Portugal, all resident residency visas, wow, once in Portugal, all residency visa holders need to report to the nearest office of the, I'm not going to say this, but it's the SEF, um, that you have to like do other st steps of your residency process through. I do speak a good amount of Portuguese because I was practicing for this because I go a lot, but is it good? No, I, I'm going to start about Portuguese because I think it's the most beautiful language. I love learning it. I love speaking it, but I haven't figured out the rule. Like that's on me. I haven't figured out the rules of it yet. So I can see a word knowing as much as I know now and still have no clue how to approach it. And I'll start, try to say it. And then the service I use will say it back to me. And I'm like that. I couldn't have been further away if I tried. Why did I even try to say this word? So it's the S E F that we'll call it that for short. Okay. So these are requirements. One visa application completely filled and duly signed by applicant. So this is, I think a three page document that I had to sign out. I had to sign out. I had to fill out and you have to have it signed. You signed it twice, like I said, and you have to have it notarized. So my friend that I applied with is an attorney and a notary. So that was really easy for me. Um, you do have to email in, I think on the website, it's only in Portuguese. So if you speak Portuguese or can, you know, something close to it, amazing. But uh, I didn't feel comfortable enough filling it out in Portuguese as someone who could have just put who knows what where. So we emailed and we got a copy in English. Uh, if I can find the link that I use or like the one that I had, maybe I'll make a link if people are interested in downloading it with the checklist and everything. Uh, let me know in the comments and I can do that. But yeah, it's just it's a very simple form to fill out. I filled out more complicated things. I feel like doing customs like border and customs declarations coming off of the plane where I'm like, oh gosh, what do I have with me? Did I get livestock? I don't remember. What if I I did get a lamb somewhere and I'm trying to bring it back. I always freak out when I have to fill those things out. But yeah, it was very simple, three pages. And it was essentially like personal information. What do you do for a living? Why do you want to, what's your reason for wanting to come to Portugal and be a resident here? Um, where are you intending on staying? Will you be supporting yourself? Will it be with this kind of thing or this kind of thing? And then you just sign the declaration. Like everything I'm presenting to you is factual as to the best of my ability. So yeah, it's, it sounds intimidating, but then you do it and you're like, oh, <laughs> That's the thing about the whole visa process. And again, this is D7 for Portugal. I did go through a residency process in Paris when I was 20, 21, when I was an au pair. Um, and I can do that in another video, but I'm sure in the 30 years since then, um, it's changed. And also I was obviously like sponsored by the family that I went through. So I didn't, this is my first time doing it totally by myself and probably why I got rejected. Okay, so... That's the thing. The process isn't hard. The process is just a lot of steps and you have to make sure you have every single step completed, which is the thing that came back and bit me in the butt. So uh, two is a recent color photograph two by two 
must accompany the application form. So those are just passport pictures. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic, I didn't feel comfortable going into, because uh, I'm in like strict quarantine, I didn't feel comfortable going into a Walgreens or a CVS or anything like that. So I went to this place down in New Orleans where one of my best friends got her pictures done uh, for her son. And it was no one in there went in. I got my two pictures. I attached, so on the application form, there's a little window to put your picture in. I attached one there and I think I like threw my other one on there too, just in case, like I just, whatever they needed, I was sending to them. I just wanted to make sure I didn't mess it up. So yeah, you just need one photo, but I have, there's a thing too. As much from VFS and from communicating with the embassy or the consulate that you do get a ton of information, it's, when you start joining like Facebook groups and talking to other people, I'm sure watching other videos, you're going to get slightly different information across the board. So I, I saw the form I needed one, but then I was reading an article and it was like, you have to send two. And then someone else was like, no, 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 it's just one. So that's why just send always a little bit extra is how I feel about it. You know? So that's two. Three, certified copies of passport or travel official travel document valid for at least three months beyond date of intended state in Portugal. The original passport must be submitted once the visa is approved. I made a big mistake here. So I so I made copies of my actual passport and I no, had them notarized by my same friend. You have to have those notarized as well as your application. And then when I mailed my whole package, I sent my actual passport. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. I think because... So I had mine sent through VFS to the agency. My friend and one of his good friends did theirs together. And he lives like a block away from the Portuguese embassy. So he just walked them in. So my friend sent his passport and they got their uh, visas that day. If only, if only I could have joined that somehow. So they got their visas that day. And so he had his passport and his thing is in it and has been sent back to him. For me, I sent it all together. And then they emailed me the next day. I had to overnight it. They emailed me the next day. And they were like, no, <laughs> take your passport back. And we will let you know if you get this visa. And then you can send it back to us. So that was another extra charge that I incurred. And I think it was like $35 that I had to I had to submit to VF VFS to mail my passport back to me. So I do have my passport. Had my visa been approved or had I... Or if I choose to go through the appeal process, which I'll get to in a little bit, uh, and I do get approved after that, I will have to mail it back to them a second time and have it mailed back to me a second time. So do not mail your visa unless, I mean, do not mail your passport unless you get a yes, you can mail in your visa now. And I am in, a, like I said, a couple of Facebook groups for like Americans in Portugal. And the timeline I've been seeing right now is people getting their visas or their passports back. I don't know why I keep using those interchangeably. Getting your passport back within six weeks weeks. That's what I've been hearing. Obviously, I haven't gone through that personally, but that's where we are right now, considering it's the holidays too. Okay, next we have four. Okay, so this is four. If you're not a U.S. citizen, proof of legal status, copy front and back, green card, U.S. visa, advanced parole, etc. And you have to specify. I am an American citizen, so I, I didn't have to do that. Uh, number five, personal statement signed by applicants specifying reasons for settling in Portugal, intended area of residency, and type of accommodations, rental, purchase of private property, or family home. So I, <laughs> this is my favorite part to do. I was an English major. I wrote this beautiful statement about how I travel to Portugal all the time and I fall in love with it. And I, so I was going to live in Madeira. I was going to live in Funchal and like split my time with Lisbon as I was getting settled and then decide where I want to go after that. So I wrote this beautiful statement. Oh, I, and then the waterfalls and the, the terraces <laughs> Stuff. Uh, it could not have been more flowery or just like, please let me live here. And, uh, but really the most, mine was very long. Most people will just do like two concise paragraphs. And it really is important that you say, I will be staying here. This is the reason why I want to do this. And so I would have been staying at a hotel. I was going to move into a hotel, like, cause I'm Eloise apparently. And so I gave them the name of the hotel, the location of it. And for like my reason for wanting to come there was because it, so I wrote it like, well, it's because of all these reasons, like, and I'm an influencer and I want to like encourage more people to come to Portugal and like work with them, that aspect. But also it's because I'm going to work remotely with the U.S. So <laughs> it's like, you can have this really beautiful reason that is the personal reason you want to do it. But also you need to say like, I am doing it because I want to do this. And this is how I'm going to support myself while I'm here. Like a very tangible sense of why do I want to come to Portugal, you know? So next we have... Uh, Confirmed accommodations. This is number six. 
from the uh, from the inviting institution if on campus or confirmed hotel reservation stating name, address, and telephone number of the hotel, including confirmation number. I so I'm stay I was going to stay in a hotel and I really lucked out because it was a hotel that I had worked with already. So I kind of have a relationship with um their PR person, but also he deals with like a lot of different aspects of running the hotel. So when I had this idea and I was like, oh, I should just move to the hotel, it'd be so much easier for me. I know it's super safe. I wrote to him and I was like, hey. <laughs> It's me. Remember, uh, we got to have like one cool week hanging out and getting to kind of know each other before the world turned upside down. And so he, he's so great. I have to tell him like the biggest thank you. And I, I've, I'm like so disappointed. I haven't talked to him yet because it's just been the weekend. This just happened on Friday. This is the weekend now. Um, but I have to tell him that it's a no go for now. So you have to have six months of confirmed reservations as well or confirmed um, housing situation as well. And so he gave me a confirmation for six months there and he didn't make me pay up front. He's like, you just do month by month because I know it might change. You might want to like get your own place here, maybe whatever. And so I really lucked out with that because I didn't have to pay anything for accommodations. A lot of people uh, have gone through Airbnb before and other hotel bookings. And I know they have had to pay up front. I mean, that's the thing about this visa process is like, it's a super privileged position to be in to even be able to apply for it. Cause you do spend a lot of money on something that's unknown. And in my situation, I didn't get it. So, uh, yeah, but a lot of people will do six months on an Airbnb or six months at another hotel where they are having to pay, but hopefully there's like an option to cancel if you don't get it. However, the chatter has been that now you have to have an actual lease, like a registered lease to prove that you have accommodations in Portugal, which obviously makes it much, much more difficult because either you need to travel to Portugal ahead of time, which is impossible right now to secure your accommodations, or you would have to do it like sight unseen in person or hire a lawyer to help you or hire a real estate, uh, I was going to say developer, that's another agent to help you. And so that's a word on the curb. I submitted my application on November. Well, it got to the embassy slash consulate because I don't know the right word on uh, November uh, 13th. I think I mailed it like November 7th. I think they like had it for a week before they sent it on to like make sure everything was okay, which again, was it, but I'll get to that. <laughs> but yeah, so I would double check that right now. I don't know if they're taking hotel and Airbnb reservations anymore. You may have to have an actual lease, which... There's a, th there's a whole thing about having to have an NIF, which is a number that you get assigned once you are a resident of Portugal. I kind of liken it to having a social security number. It's the number through which you do everything. And I think you may have to have an NIF to get a lease in Portugal. You also need it for bank accounts. We will come back to this. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> okay. So the next thing is proof of financial support. Bank statements, electronic printouts are accepted. Proof of a uh, pension is also accepted. For, so for this, because I am a freelancer, I am self-employed, I sent them three or no, I think I sent more. I think I sent them like six months of bank statements. So, cause I wanted them to see that my savings was current and like untouched. It wasn't like I just added a windfall of money to be like, oh yeah, I can totally afford to live here. Um, that it was something that was always steady and it was growing. Uh, but I also just wanted them to see that I had income coming in because I am a freelancer, because I don't have a company that can write a letter for me. I don't have a boss that can vouch for me. I had to send them a bunch of my contracts to, uh, prove to them the amount of money that I was making per month. Now I could never find an exact, uh, denomination, not the right word, an exact total that you had to make per month, uh, that you had to make per month. But most, the consensus is the most people I talked to said it was like $2,000 a month minimum. I don't know if that's true. I make at least that. So for me, I didn't have an issue with it, but it, I, I don't know. It could be more than that now. It could be something less than that. So in one place that they want you to have at, le at least 50,000 American, uh, again, for US people applying, um, in a bank account or across stocks or across pensions or retirement accounts. I'm not undergone through retirement process. I don't really know about pensions and stuff like that. I should probably learn because I'm like halfway to retirement age. But anyway, I'll do it on another day. Uh, but yeah, I also saw that figure, but I only saw that figure in one place. I don't know if that's a real thing. And again, it's a lot of just like talking to different people. Everyone kind of has a different experience, a tiny bit and trying your best when you send your application. So yeah, I had to do, or like my friend who's an attorney, he he's employed he's self-employed as well so uh he sent 
I know bank statements. He sent three months of bank statements. I think he sent like some of his investments and he sent some of his leases because he has tenants. And like, I think just from his rental properties alone, he, he meets that $2,000 threshold. So that's what he sent in. I know some people, you have to send in like a proof of an LLC or like a business that you own or that you're registered as a self-employed person. I always knew for me, it was going to be a little difficult to apply for a visa because I am totally self-employed. Like I'm totally freelance and my <laughs> form is like, you have to fill out what your job is. And I know they always be like, oh, I'm an attorney, I'm an architect, I'm a doctor, I'm a this, a that. And then for me, I had to put like influencer. <laughs> like they're probably like, oh, what does that mean? Usually when I fill out anything official like that, like when I did unemployment, you know, during all this, I had to just put photographer because a lot of these things aren't, being an influencer and a content creator and a blogger and blogger kind of newer entities, even though they've been around the last like 10, 15 years. So I just played photographer and I just filled it out like to the best of my ability to kind of flesh it out a little bit. I explained more of my personal statement, but I knew digital nomad visas or not specifically digital nomad visas would be a little more difficult because there's no company verifying that they've, they're supporting me or they've got me. Like I have to do it all on my own. So if you are also like fully self-employed like that and you freelance and you're that kind of digital nomad, that's something else to watch out for. I would say start getting your contracts together now. Start getting, if you don't have an LSC established one or whatever like entity uh, works for you, just so you have proof that you are actually working. In fact, when I sent off my stuff to VFS at first, they wrote me back and they were like, mm, so can you prove that you make this money a month? And I was like, you have all my bank statements. And they were like, no. <laughs> Like we need proof of income, not that you have money that, but that you will have money coming in. So I had to get like all my contracts together that day. It was, this is before I fired two clients too. So it was like a hot mess trying to get it together, but I did. So if you are in the freelance digital nomad position, like I am, um, if you're an influencer, if you're a content creator, if you know, just totally self-employed, you don't have a business that you're able to work for a, a boss, anyone that can vouch for you, make sure you have as many documents of financial proof as possible because it will come up. Trust me. Okay. So <clears throat> criminal number eight, criminal record certificate for applicants older than 15 issued by the FBI. <clears throat> Sorry. My allergies are kicking my butt today. Uh, this document must be requested, must be requested with an apostille. I swear I did do this. Basically it is this like certain way that it has to be verified and has to be sealed. Let me, okay, I'll get to that in a second. So yeah, I had to go, this is, I'll put the link down in um, the episode, episode notes, sorry, I have a podcast. I'll put the link down in the description of this video, but on here it's www.fbi.gov slash, okay, that's too long to read, but basically you have to have a background check that you supply. So you go to this website and you fill it out and you request it. And I think the fee I had to pay was like, I wrote all this down and of course now I like don't know where I put that notebook, but I think it was either 18 or $38. It wasn't anything that expensive. Uh, and then they give you two options, which is you can go and do fingerprints uh, at one of their like approved places, or you can go and get fingerprinted on your own. And I don't know where to go get fingerprints. I'm barely an adult. So I was like, all right, well, my friend and I decided to go do it the same day because you know, it's easier or less scary. So we were like, yeah, let's go to one of the approved places. And then I think because I went through the, it was a post office. I think a lot of them are post offices because I did that. We had to pay $50 to have our fingerprinting done. So I don't think we had to make an appointment. We just walked in, we drove down to New Orleans. We walked in, we did our fingerprints. It took me like 30 minutes, the machine would not recognize my fingerprints. I was like, am I alive? Why will they recognize? I promise I haven't committed any crimes. I haven't burnt off my fingertips at any point. What's happening? So it took forever. And then of course my friends was like done. And they, <clears throat> the pad that you put your fingers on to trace, to trace them, uh, it's hooked up to a system like with the FBI or like the, 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 their software in the post office is hooked up with the software at the FBI or wherever it went. <laughs> may not be, I'm being so technical. I don't know if that's where it goes exactly. And so as soon as they submit it on the post office in, you get it immediately. And then they mail you a physical copy. So I have a copy on my phone forever in case I have to do this again. But I think when I apply for another visa, which is my plan at this point, I think I'm going to have to um, go and get my fingerprints done again, which... 
it just it just took so long because it didn't recognize my fingers. I don't know what I was doing wrong. Uh, yeah, so so that's actually really easy because you get it like immediately. You can look at it yourself. Be like, okay, cool. I didn't you know black out at any point and commit a crime that I forgot about. <laughs> so this should be good. I'm all clear. And then you get your physical copy in the mail. Do not open that envelope that they sent to you. It has to be sealed. Uh, to go on to the embassy you have to have it like in this exact format for them to accept it or you have to go and do it all over again or you have to go out and find the person that can put it like can prove that it hasn't been like tampered with or whatever it is that you've opened it so do not open your FBI background check I know you're curious just look at it on your phone and then nicely put it with your sack of things you're going to mail and do not open it Trust me, you don't want to add another layer to this already kind of complicated process. Okay, and then uh, nine is permission to the Department of Borders and Customs to obtain criminal records from Portugal. So it's just this little paper. I can also put a link down if uh, you know you want to get it from there. I I think we got it from the consulate. They emailed it to us, and it's just this little paragraph in Portuguese that gives them permission, and you sign it and date it, and you're done with that. So that's probably the easiest step in this whole thing. Um, 10 copy of marriage certificate and children's birth certificate. Don't have any of that. No worries. And then, uh, 11 was proof of health insurance for that covers medical expenses in Portugal. So you're supposed to buy six months worth of medical insurance as of when I applied within the last month and a half. I cannot remember the name of the company that I use now, but it's right in my email. So I will also put it down below. I think when all was said and done, it was like 168 euro or something like not bad for six months of coverage. I think I got like the second tier of coverage too. So um, yeah, but you have to have proof of health insurance. I think you do have to get up to a specific deductible. Listen to me talking about deductibles. Like I know anything about health insurance. I don't at all, but I will put the link below. And also I will link like directly to the one that I purchased. So, and they accepted that. There was no problem with it. So that is the checklist that... I have from VFS that you can't see at all. I don't know why I'm showing you. And so that's everything I sent. And uh, you have to pay. I have the three amounts like written somewhere really close, but I don't feel like taking for it. I'll put it in the, uh, the, not the episode, it's the comments too. But then you have to send three checks. One is for processing for VFS. One is $35 to send your uh, pass. Is it? Yeah, to send your passport back to you once you do have your visa, if you are approved for it. And then one is for like the consulate to process it. I think it was like one nineteen thirty five and like seventy five thirty four or something. I'll look it up and I'll put the right ones down there. And these also change by month. So you have to go to the website and make sure that you're sending the right amount. And you have to send a cashier's check. Cashier's or a money order. You have to send a money order. <laughs> you can see how much I like don't ever do anything. <laughs> I had to ask my friends, like, how do I get a money order? And they were like, you have to go to the post office and have cash. And I was like, no, that's too complicated. So I was like, can I just go to the bank? And they're like, oh, yeah, you can go to the bank. <laughs> so that's what I did. And then I sent everything. Uh, you get a prepaid label. But if you VFS and it says you send an email, I believe, and then they send you a link and you go to the link and you purchase, I think it's $35, and they send you the mailing slip like the the address with the barcode that you send and I think it did have to go through FedEx so I packed up all my stuff I brought it to FedEx I mailed it off and I was like I'm gonna have a visa by the end of the week because my friend got his so fast <laughs> oh about the background check too so let me let's rewind I so like I said don't open it when you get it and you have to mail it off to them but also now I've been seeing in the uh the Facebook groups that you have to also send another copy to the State Department. I had not heard anything about that when I was doing mine. I, the only place I've seen it has been in this specific group. So I would double check on that. Like I said, it changes every month what they ask for and what they require. So it could very well be a new requirement. Okay, so let's fast forward back to us sending my stuff off. So I was like, I'm going to get in the week. This is going to be so great. <laughs> so I, got, I sent it. The next day, I get an email from VFS saying, oh, we received your thing for Portugal. And I'm like, oh, yes, it's all happening. And then uh, I got an email like the next day that said, oh, we, you need to send proof of income. And that's when I was like, I did. I sent you all my bank statements. But they were like, no, 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 no. So I wrote back and I did like specify what exactly do I need. That's when they told me we need contracts. We need like LLC registration papers. We need some kind of documentation. So that's when I got all my contracts together. I sent them over. I sent that over on like a Monday. They wrote me back. 
and I think they were like, oh yeah, this is fine. It's been received. And I was like, great. Oh wait, I forgot something important. You also have to have, it wasn't on the checklist, but you do have to do this. Uh, you have to have a proof, your proof of flight to go to Portugal. So I had to buy a flight. I bought it on Delta and uh, have that included in my paperwork that I sent all together. Was there anything else that was on the checklist I had to do? I think the flight was the only thing that I, that wasn't on the checklist, but I knew that I had to submit it because of my friend and other stuff I had been reading. Uh, so yeah, I, it, it does, when you buy your flight and you like make your reservations where you have to stay, it's like you have to do one stage to get to the next stage, which makes it kind of annoying if you're like me and you live kind of like a more spontaneous life and then you have to make all these plans without even knowing if it's going to work out or not. So I got my flight first and then I got my insurance and then I got my place to stay and then I filled out my application. It was like the last step I actually did because I had to say like what day I plan on arriving, what country I was going to be entering to. That's also something because I'm from Louisiana, there's no direct flights into Portugal. I'm always going to have to stop well, I probably could have stopped like New York to Lisbon or Newark to Lisbon or DC to Lisbon, but the flight that I was on and obviously flights are like diminished now. There's not offering as many options because of everything going on. Um, my first stop would have either had to have been Paris through Air France, Charles de Gaulle, or it would have been Amsterdam with KLM. So I don't, I wouldn't have had first entry into Portugal and I have, I don't, obviously I didn't get that far, but I have seen some people saying they've had issues at the airport because when they get there, people are the, the not customs, but I guess border patrol, uh, tells them, no, you can't enter Portugal. Like a visa is not good enough. You have to have a residency card or like proof of residency. So that has been happening too. Also, you obviously have to have COVID tests right now. Where I was going at Madeira Funchal, they do a COVID test when you land at the airport, which is another reason I was like, I have to move here. They're so on top of it. Um, and if you do test positive, you have to go into a hotel for quarantine for two weeks. And I think do like a series of tests after that to prove that you're better or where, wherever you need to go from there. Uh, so yeah, you do have to have your flights ahead of time. That's important. Back to the... FS, which I keep wanting to call VHS, which helps no one. So I got an email from them and they were saying, oh, it's been sent to the embassy and consulate. And meanwhile, every time I'm getting an email from them, I'm like, oh, this is it. I've been approved. This is so great. Because again, my friend got it same day from walking in. So I'm thinking they're just going through visas like hotcakes. And so I opened the email and it's like, okay, great. So it's been sent off and you will have a decision within 60 business days. And I was like, uh oh, I think I bought my flight for why well, bought it for February 2nd I was like is that 60 business days from now well, I have enough time and, you know when you're thinking oh I bought a flight in November until February I have so much time to do everything I need to do but when you don't have a decision until maybe January the second week of January you're leaving the next month you're like oh I really rushed this like this isn't good so mine took I think exactly one month so mine got there on November 13th I got a decision on December 13th I believe what's Today's the 20th. Okay, no, so mine, I got a decision on December 16th. And that's when I opened my email and I was like, I knew it was coming because in all these groups that I'm in, people were like, oh, well, I sent mine this time and we just got our decision and we got approved and it's so great. And I was like, oh, that's it. I'm, I'm totally gonna get approved on Friday. Like, I can't wait. I'm gonna start packing. It's gonna be so exciting. Except I started to see this chatter in these groups where people were like, well, this is what I sent, everything I sent, but then also our NIF and a bank accounts. Huh. I don't remember seeing that anywhere. And when I got, when VFS wrote back to me and they said, oh, you need to have proof of income, I would have assumed they would have mentioned it at that point, but no. So I was a little nervous about that. So anyway, I opened my email on Friday. This is what I had to say. Uh, you have received a decision of unfavorable from the immigration services. I hope it's okay that I read this. I feel like it's fine. Uh, attached, please find the official notification. The reason for that decision is where the X sign is on the second page. It states that you haven't presented proof of funds in a Portuguese bank equivalent of 12 months of the national minimum salary, which at present time is 635 euro monthly. So I wanted to read the exact wording of it. Because like I said, if you were applying, this was not a requirement that I heard about, knew about, was told about, could find anywhere. I only saw it in these Facebook groups and I only saw it within like the last three or four days. Apparently the rule went through on November 4th. I think I mailed, mine arrived on like November 7th. Of course. <laughs> and I would have gone in October like my friend did, except I was waiting for like one more thing to come through before I could send them everything. 
And for him, when he got his same day, then they reached out to him like two or three weeks later, maybe a month later and said, oh, you need to open a bank account. For me, it was, you need to have a bank account to have your visa, which I don't. And this is why. So, well, obviously why? Because I don't live in Portugal. I haven't opened a bank account there yet. But everything I read, heard, watched thus far in my application process says, when you get to Portugal, you go to SEF, you get your, I, I might have this a little off because I haven't gone through the process, but this is a gist of it. You go, you get your residency card, you get your NIF, and then you're able to open your bank account. So for me, the process was, or everything I've read is get your visa, go to Portugal, do your rest of your paperwork, get established as a resident. Then you get your, or you get your NIF somewhere in that process. It's a part of your like getting settled in Portugal process. And then you can open your bank account. So I was like, easy peasy. I'll totally do that. I was thinking of like the hurdles I have to pass in America and then the hurdles I have to pass once I get to Portugal. Because I have done the immigration process before. I remember when I was in uh, Paris, I had to get a carte de long séjour, like a, a card for long staying, a residence card basically. And I had to go get in the physical. I had to fill out all this paperwork. My host family had to fill out all this stuff. I had to like, pay, they had to pay another fee. So you definitely have stuff on both sides that you have to do when you're moving. It's not like, oh, you get your visa and then every life's great. It's actually such a headache dealing with all this stuff, but it's worth it. So I was like, yeah, I'll get my NIF, open a bank account, everything. Um, but I do, from everyone I've talked to and all the things I've read, I know people do have a hard time getting an NIF. It's, stuff dealing dealing with stuff on that and I've got me the idea that it can be a bit like um what I like getting a SAG card which I'm not an actor but I just know this like to get into SAG you need to be in a project but to be in a project you need to be in SAG so it's kind of this like how do I I think it was like double dutch like how do I jump in on the double dutch because it's already going in motion I have to get in like the exact right way in time so I know people have definitely had issues with getting their NIF and I know with like opening bank accounts and doing just all kinds of other things once you're sold in Portugal, but you're in Portugal, like you figure it out, you deal with it. So news to me is that this change that happened literally three days before I mailed myself off is that I would have to have this bank account and I would have to have an NIF. I don't have either <laughs> because I didn't know I needed it. And on my email that I didn't read, it says that I would have 10 days to appeal this decision. Again, everything that I read and heard and researched about moving to Portugal and getting NIF is that it takes quite a bit of time and it also takes quite a bit of time to open a, a bank account and you have to have all these forms again and you have to like prove all this stuff and income and everything. And I mean, for that amount, I did like the quick math in the car. If I was going to put that into US dollars, I would have to do something close to like eight, 9,000 US uh, into a Portuguese bank, which... Isn't not doable, but I'm like, do I want to transfer all that over and then they still reject me? <laughs> or there's like another reason I didn't get it, or they just still decide, no, like, nah, girl, too many people have applied and you came in too late, or you didn't do this right, and I don't want my money to just be tied up. And like, what if I get to Portugal and it turns out I don't want to live there and I want to go do something else and I want to travel all the time? And you do have to, like, that's something that I kind of came around to after I had gone through the application process was that you do, you're establishing residency. So you have to live there, you know? And to me, it's kind of like, I want to be based in Europe, but I still want to travel as much as I was before. And so I don't even know if that was the right visa for me. So this is kind of like, uh, we're just, I'm figuring out if it is the right thing for me or if this all happened for a reason. But uh, yeah, you have to have that. So <laughs> about 9, 10K in uh, US dollars deposited into a Portuguese bank that you have to open up. I have had, I have seen some people say you don't need the NIF to open a bank account online. And some people say you do. It's again, one of those things where it's like, depending on who you talk to, you might get a different answer. And also I was seeing that it was only the San Francisco. So I think there's three embassy or and or consulates you can go through New York, DC and San Francisco. Because I'm based in Louisiana, I went to DC, they tell you which one to go to. And a lot of people were saying, oh, the bank account thing and the NIF thing is only for San Francisco. But I went through DC. And surprise, it was at DC too. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I'm at. That is the thing that happened to me or the thing that I left out, the mistake that I made, but also the mistake that I wasn't told that I was making that stopped me from getting my visa to Portugal that I've talked about endlessly on the channel and every week been like, I'm going to have a visa update soon. I'm going to, it's going to be great. <laughs> Turns out it was unfavorable. So that's where we are right now because, and then I have 10 days to appeal, but because it's supposed to be kind of a lengthy process, I am also like, I don't know if I can get it done because it's, I may post this later, 
But where I am right now, it's Christmas week. And Portugal is a very Catholic country. I don't know if they're going to be trying to, like, help me open bank accounts and stuff. They're probably celebrating and getting ready for the holidays like just the rest of us are. And so that 10-day window is, um, I don't know. I don't know about that 10-day window, if it's even something that is something I can accomplish in that amount of time or if it's something I even want to accomplish in that amount of time because there is something else I'm interested in. I was, <clears throat> truth be told, getting like a little bit of cold feet about Portugal because another visa opened up, like I said, and I'm really, really interested in that one. And it is for digital nomads, so it might be a little more of a friendly, pro not that this process was bad at all. It wasn't, it was, it was intimidating at the start, but that's just because I get easily overwhelmed by things, but it was, it wasn't bad at all. Um, but this other one, I think because it's for digital nomads, it may be easier, which I like. <laughs> it's a place I've always wanted to go and always felt like I needed to live for a little while. So I may just end up chilling out and putting my eggs in that basket and seeing what happens. And if that doesn't happen, I'll just hopefully get a vaccine and can go back to traveling a little bit here and there and go from there. There's always other options. So it's not like I'm crushed or heartbroken about this. I mean, I'm young ish. I have plenty of time to figure out where I want to live and where I want to set up base and everything. Right now, I just want to travel. And so that was my impetus behind getting this visa. I feel like in my heart, I really, really love Europe. And it's so much easier to travel around Europe when you're already in Europe. You know, don't have to do any of those crazy 10, 15 hour flights to get up there. It's a hop, skip and a jump when you're already based there. And that's what I'm really interested in. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I'm still going to try to think about it a couple more days and see. I also wrote back to them. I was like, I wasn't aware of this this requirement. No one made it clear to me. I wrote to BFS. I wrote to the embassy consulate <laughs> and I told them. And so I am waiting to see what options they may have for me, but they're saying, no, you have to do this and you're down to eight days for all then. And they just have to let the Portugal dream go for now. But, oh, and one more thing before I'll let you go in a second, I promise. But one more thing is that, uh, I kept having flight changes that were coming up in my email and I understand, I mean, I'm not complaining about that. I understand that they're having to consolidate flights or having to cancel flights or doing a limited number, but my Delta flight was with Air France as well. And so they kept changing the time. And the last update I got, I wasn't gonna be able to make my next flight to Funchal in Madeira. And so I wrote to them and I was like, hey, uh, I'm having like a schedule conflict. What are my options here? And they're like, oh, well we can fly you like the day before to Lisbon, but then you'd have to, you know, stay the night in Lisbon and take care of that yourself. Or we just refund you. And I have, as someone who flies all the time, or did, I have never had an airline be like, oh, we'll just give you your money back. It was such a beautiful moment to me. <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I didn't know you would just offer to do this to me. And there's so many times where I've had to, Delta in particular, yell at them and fuss at them and curse them out uh, over Twitter for multiple hours because of things they've messed up with me. Uh, and you know what? Bless the customer service people. They're, they they try their hardest and it's not their fault that my luggage got left in Atlanta for four days one time. And when I got it, it was everything inside was soaking wet. But I have, I've had a little, I've had tips with Delta here and there and, um, you know, to varying forms of resolution, but for, th for them to just be like, oh, we'll just refund you. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when I was starting to have issues with the flights and then like a little bit of my second thoughts that I was having. And then I got the rejection. I was like, well, maybe this is all working out the way it's supposed to. And I really should look into pursuing this other thing that I'm really interested in. And maybe, you know, if you watch my other videos, I lit that candle for like obstacle remover. And maybe the obstacle was Portugal and I just wasn't aware of it. So that could be the case. I feel like I'm kind of getting signs that I should go in this other direction, but I still wanted to make this video because I know a lot of people are interested in Portugal, moving to Portugal, Portugal visas, the D7 in particular, because it's kind of the best one out there for people like me or, you know, people that fit the criteria. And also I want to make people aware of why I didn't get it because I didn't know that that was going to be the reason I didn't get it. And two, because like along the line, you'll be reached out to by the embassy uh, and they'll say, oh, you're missing this. We need this. And I never got that. It was just a no. And then you can appeal. So that is my story with my D7 presidency visa for Portugal. Not mine because I didn't get it, but the process I went through to try to get it. And I really hope this video has been helpful. I hope it helps that I went through the checklist. I will try to find relevant links uh, for all the stuff I mentioned. So the application, the checklist, that customs and borders form for Portugal, and my health insurance, those four things. If there's anything else that I said, just remind me in the comments and I'll try to find them. So you will have up-to-date and accurate information because I didn't quite, and that's what got me in the end. But I definitely don't want to discourage anyone 
from applying that is curious and like poking around about it because Portugal is amazing. I would have loved to have lived there. But since I do think this other thing is kind of working out for me and it's lining up, I'm going to pursue that instead and not do the appeal. Although if I do choose to do the appeal and I go through that too, I will definitely make another video. But yes, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments or you can see me on Instagram on Chow Mickey there as well. Um, and other than that, like, share, comment, subscribe, come back, all those wonderful things. And I do hope to see you again. I Again, I hope this was really helpful and I hope that you won't make the same mistakes I did and that you will do as I say in this video and not as I did when I messed everything up. <laughs> But until next time, mwah, goodbye.